I would like to welcome you all to our first attempt at a video service. And for copyright purposes and your well-being, I will not be singing any hymns to you. I want you to know that I am available by phone or email if you need anything during this time of social distancing. And if anyone should come down sick, please let me know, or if anyone in your neighborhood should be diagnosed with COVID-19, let me know. I will be trying to make contact by phone to keep up with what's going on and to check on you through this time of distancing. I'd like to start with a call to worship based on the 23rd Psalm. The world offers busy schedules and more stuff to do, but God offers rest. And your reply would be, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The world offers faster cars and bigger houses, but God offers comfort. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The world offers war and terror, but God offers protection. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The world offers cheap love and cheap thrills, but God offers goodness and mercy. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. Come now and let us dwell in the house of the Lord. Now, would you pray with me, please? O oh God, you divided the waters of chaos at creation. In Christ you stilled storms, raised the dead, and vanquished demonic powers. Keep us from all things that may hurt us, that we, being ready in both body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish those things you command. Hear our humble intercession for all races and families on earth, that you will keep them from harm and devastating illness. Keep us from calling disaster your justice. Our strength has been brought low, and we don't know what the future holds. In our bodies there's pain, in our souls anxiety and unrest. If it may be, restore us to health. We pray together for the safety and health of all those in our congregations and in our communities. Help us in good times and in distress to trust your mercy and yield to your power this day and forever. In the matchless name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. The title for this week's sermon is In Right Paths. And as I, I think it's important for us to realize this as we go through these times of social distancing. And now I know some are saying that by doing this we're not trusting God to take care of us. And I sometimes feel the same way. I've even made the statement that if God wants me to get sick, I'm going to get sick and ain't nothing going to stop it from happening. Also, if God don't want me sick, I ain't going to get sick. But I also remember the joke about the believer who during a flood prayed to God for help. And when the water started to rise, the fire department came by and offered to take him to safety. And the man replied, God will save me. The water rose to the second floor and a rescue boat came to get him and he said, No thanks, God will save me. Now on the roof, a helicopter comes by and tries to save him. Again he replies, God will save me. The man drowns and is now in front of God and he asks, Why didn't you save me? And God says, I sent the fire department a boat and a helicopter. What else did you want me to do? I read something put out by a university dean explaining the closing of the school, and he said, we may never be able to tell if we overreacted, but we would be able to tell if we underreacted. And another thing I read said, if we engage in social distancing and nothing happens, that was the plan. This social distancing could just be the remedy sent by God to help curtail this pandemic. And if we ignore it, we may be the guy standing in front of God asking, why didn't you save me? And by agreeing to socially distance ourselves, we could be putting our feet on the right path set forth by God for our best interests. Okay, moving right along. Our scripture for this week is the 23rd Psalm. And of all the Psalms of the Bible, the 23rd Psalm is probably the most loved. 
it is almost impossible to read these six verses without hearing a favorite version of it being sung. There are many hymns and songs that take the central themes of the psalm and wrap them in beautiful music. Now we could argue for a long time about why this brief psalm has captured the hearts of so many, but at the heart of this hymn is an invitation to trust in the one who provides care, the one who gathers in, the one who heals and comforts and loves, the one who puts our feet on the right path. And that's our prayer during this season of distancing. Guide my feet while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Now this line comes from the spiritual for this week called Guide My Feet. And the lyrics go, Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. There are four other verses, and each verse repeats itself three times. So I'm just only going to read it once. Verse 2 is, Hold my hand while I run this race for I don't want to run this race in vain. Verse 3, stand by me while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Verse 4, I'm your child while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. And verse 5, search my heart while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Well, let's get into our scripture for today. It is the 23rd Psalm, and I would like you to listen as I read it to you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Gracious Father, we ask your blessing upon the reading of your word, and we ask that you would be here with us and each one of us as we are in our private dwellings. I pray for all of those watching this video, Lord, and ask that you would be with them. Spirit, move through these words to those that are listening. Amen. Now these are perhaps the most familiar six verses of the whole Bible, with many translations written into songs of a variety of genres and parodied in more ways than even Google, Google can catalog. The 23rd Psalm holds a place in the canon of Scripture that is unparalleled. And yet, do we listen to it? Do we examine its depths and live into its promises? Or do we simply slip into it like a warm bath, soothing and comforting, but hidden beneath the frothy bubbles of the comfort that we seek? Now, comfort is important. So is being soothed when we ache and when we are unsettled. We long for those arms to wrap around us and protect us, to shelter us, to love us when it seems no one else will. But David was hoping for more. Wanting more than simply balm to soothe our troubled souls when he wrote this psalm. You see, Psalm 23 is about equipping, about building up so that we can walk, so we can live. Not just exist, but live. Now, to be sheep means being fully dependent upon your shepherd for your safety and protection from the evils of the world. Sheep are susceptible animals. They are easy prey that are unable to fend for themselves. We are more like sheep than we probably want to admit, but the wolf we are powerless to on our own is sin. We need a shepherd powerful enough to defeat sin and death on our behalf. That shepherd is Jesus who came into the world to lay down his life for you and me. His sheep, not just so that we may survive, but rather thrive in the fullness of life that he has to offer. The shepherd doesn't just protect us, doesn't just feed us, but he makes us alive. He restores my soul. A soul 
living being, life, self, desire, passion, appetite, emotion, that's the definition of the Hebrew word that is there, nefesh. It's not simply a breathing being. It's not simply an entity that is content, upright, taking in nourishment, but one that is enjoying the meal, one that is alive to the greenness of the grass and the depth of the still water teeming with life itself. He makes me alive again. Again, like I was created to be. Like I've been in moments that make my heart pound and my eyes tear up and the laughter burst from my lips. I want that again. I want to walk in the right paths. Not the paths of self-destruction and self-satisfaction, self-centered preferences or preference-driven gluttony. I want to live in your paths, Lord. Because only those paths will keep me alive when the darkness comes, when death surrounds, when despair grips so tightly hope slips from our fingers. Guide my feet while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Restore my soul. And then, typical of attention deficit David, we leap from pastures to dining room. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Without a warning or commercial break, we find ourselves ushered into a luxurious ballroom, a convention center like we've stumbled into a wedding reception we aren't sure we're invited to. The table is groaning under the weight of all of our favorites, so we, we lunge to our seat and we dig in before we notice that the guest list includes many we would have left off those we hoped to avoid. But the waiter keeps filling our cup. We thought we would just eat and leave, but we're stuck. We're there with them. Them. And we're blessed by it. I've often wondered what David had in mind with that in the presence of my enemy's line. He probably thought about thumbing his nose at them behind the velvet rope, kept at bay by the same servers who kept the cup overflowing. He probably thought it was an in-your-face kind of taunt, a bit of I'll show them that they don't know what they're messing with. I wonder if that's what he thought as he wrote it with a cruel grin on his face, not realizing that the inspiration for the verse was taking him farther than he intended to go, than he hoped to go, than he wanted to go. Search my heart while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Those right paths, those tables in the presence, they're not so frothy and bubbly when you think about it, not so comforting, not so warm bath-like. The Lord as shepherd isn't the walk in the park we might have imagined. It has an edge, a demand hidden inside, and he gives us a hint. He gives himself one too, I suspect. And the hint is in the word choice at the end of the psalm. Our translators hid it from us, uncertain how we would respond to it, perhaps afraid we would be confused by the real message. We make it a passive message because comfort and ease sounds passive to us. But there's nothing passive about the job of a shepherd, and that's why he's got a rod and a staff. The staff was the crook used to keep the sheep on path, hooking the end around the neck of the wandering sheep and lifting them bodily back into a new, safer direction. The rod was a weapon, a ninja bow staff or a boken, used to fight off the enemies that would make a meal of the poor, unsuspecting and defenseless sheep. The shepherd's life was at risk all the time. Not a very passive profession. So why a passive ending? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Like a puppy, a lost lamb, ready for me to turn and take it when I wanted it and to leave it when it's inconvenient for me. But I'm in charge. It follows me. I'll acknowledge it when there's time, when I'm in the mood, when nothing better comes my way. Surely it'll be there, waiting for me. Except it isn't waiting. The verb is an active verb. A better translation would be, Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me, shall chase after me all the days of my life. 
That's what I want, isn't it? A love that will not let me go, that will chase after me even when I try to run, even when I think I'm not worth chasing, even when I don't know what I want, even when I don't want to recognize the help being offered by God, the help I asked for? Some may struggle with the opening verse, I shall not want. Doesn't that say we shouldn't want anything, that wanting is bad, or anti-faith somehow? Well, we are made to want. It's a part of who we are, part of the human condition. A life of faith doesn't remove the wanting. In some, in some ways, it, it drives it. We need to long for the kingdom, to want justice, to work for peace, and to not settle for anything less. We need to want to be alive and to rid ourselves of anything that makes us less than all God created us to be and want to stop letting anyone tell us we are less than we are in God. And what, did they, what David meant was that when he stopped to think about it, he had everything he needed to be alive. Maybe what should have been said is, the Lord is my shepherd, I'm going to stop whining when I don't get my way. Or better, not my will, but thine be done. Hold my hand while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Jesus came into the world to lay down his life for you and for me, his sheep, not just so that we may survive, but rather thrive in the fullness of life that he has to offer. Let's pray. God of comfort, peace, and security, we know that trusting you for protection will not guard us from every danger. But we can rest assured that no power on heaven or earth can separate us from the presence of your love. Guide our feet, hold our hand, search our heart while we run this race so that our running will glorify you. Amen. Friends, Fully rely on the Lord to be with you as we continue through these times of uncertainty. Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue us all the days of our lives. So be blessed and remember that you can contact me with any questions or concerns. I'll talk to you soon.